Now, if you have the, the Majima Nikaya, we are going to be working now on Majima Nikaya number 28, the Maha Sutta. Maha Atipadabhama Sutta. This is the greater discourse on the simile of the elephant's footprint. <coughs> Excuse me. Thus I have heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in Sawati, in Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's Park. And there the Venerable Sariputta addressed the bhikkhus thus, friends, Bhikkhus, they replied, and the Venerable Sariputta said this. Friends, just as the footprint of any living being that walks can be placed within an elephant's footprint. And so the elephant's footprint is declared the chief of them because of its great size. So too, all wholesome states can be included in the four noble truths. In what four? The noble truth of suffering, in the noble truth of the origin of suffering, in the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, and in the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. And what is the noble truth of suffering? Birth is suffering. Aging and death is suffering. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are suffering. Not to obtain what one wants is suffering. And in short, the five aggregates affected by clinging are suffering. And what are the five aggregates affected by clinging? They are material form aggregate affected by clinging, the feeling aggregate affected by clinging, the perception aggregate affected by clinging, the formations aggregate affected by clinging, and the consciousness aggregate affected by clinging. And what is the material form aggregate affected by clinging? It is the four great elements and the material form derived from the four great elements. And what are the four great elements? They are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the air element. The earth element. What, friends, is the earth element? The earth element may be either internal or external. What is the internal earth element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, and clung to, and that is head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bone, and bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, contents of the stomach, the feces, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, and clung to. This is called the internal earth element. Now both the internal earth element and the external earth element are simply earth element. 
And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element, makes the mind dispassionate towards the earth element. <coughs> now there comes a time when the water element is disturbed and then the external earth element vanishes. When even the external earth element, the great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance and change, what of this body, which is clung to by craving and lasts but a while? There can be no considering that I, or mine, or I am. So then if others abuse and revile and scold and harass me, who has seen this element as it actually is, he understands thus, this painful feeling born of ear contact has arisen in me that is dependent, not independent, Dependent on what? Dependent on contact. And then he sees that contact is impermanent, that feeling is impermanent, that perception is impermanent, that formations are impermanent, and that consciousness is impermanent. And his mind having made an element, its objective, support, enters into that new objective support and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. Now, if others attack that monk in ways that are unwished for, undesired and disagreeable by contact with fists or clods or sticks or knives, he understands this. This body is of such a nature that contact with fists and clods and sticks and knives assail it. But this has been said by the Blessed One in his advice on the simile of the saw. Monks, even if bandits were to sever you savagely, limb by limb with a two-handed saw, he who gave rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be carrying out my teaching. So tireless energy shall be aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness will be established, my body, shall be tranquil and untroubled. My mind will be concentrated and unified. Now let with, and now let contact with fists and clods and sticks and knives assail the body. For this teaching of the Buddha is being practiced by me. So when that monk thus recollects the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha, if equanimity supported by wholesome, thoughts does not become established in him. Then he arouses a sense of urgency. <clears throat> and thus it is a loss for me. It is not a gain for me. It is bad for me. It is no good for me. That when I thus collect the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha, equanimity supported by the wholesome does not become established in me. Just as when a daughter-in-law sees her father-in-law, she arouses a sense of urgency. <coughs> Excuse me, please. She arouses a sense of urgency to please him. 
So too, when the monk thus recollects the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, if equanimity supported by the wholesome does not become established in him, then he arouses a sense of urgency. But when he recollects the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, equanimity supported by the wholesome becomes established in him, and he is satisfied with it. And at that point, friends must uh, friends, much has been done by that bhikkhu, and he will not be hurt in the same way. Just one minute. Sorry. <clears throat> So this is looking at remembering the Buddha and what he teaches, remembering the Dhamma as you know it. This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. And the Sangha, how they follow this. They are supposed to be following this. And when something threatens them, if they think of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha in a very wholesome way, equanimity comes over them. And then this protects them from being hurt by things that are being thrown at them or other people in a group are being hurt. They are not as hurt as much and they are able to let these things go. And very often people will not touch those people. If you look them in the eye and you're balanced and you are understanding what is happening and you are not showing such fear and ready for knee jerk reaction, this kind of thing, that this is all balanced within the person from the equanimity and the outcome is different. This is what this is talking about. Now the water element. <clears throat> What, friends, is the water element? The water element may be either internal or external. What is the internal water element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is water and clung to. And this is the bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, urine, and whatever else internally belonging to oneself that is water, watery, and clung to, held on to. This is called the internal water element. Now, both the internal water element and the external water element are simply water element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the water element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the water element. Now there comes a time when the external water element is disturbed. And it carries away villages, towns, and cities, districts, and countries. And there comes a time when the waters in the great ocean sink down 100 leagues, 200 leagues, 300 leagues, 400 leagues, 500 leagues, 600 leagues, 700 leagues. And there come a time when the waters in the great ocean stand seven palms deep, six palms deep five, four, three, or two palms deep, only one palm deep. And there comes a time when the waters in the great ocean stand uh, seven fathoms deep. And there comes a time when the waters in the great ocean stand half, only half a fathom deep, only waist deep, only ankle deep, only only knee deep, I'm sorry, and then only an ankle deep. There comes a time when the waters in the great ocean are not enough to wet even the joint of a single finger. 
when even this external water element, great as it is, is to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance, and change. What of this body, which is clung to by craving and lasts for a while, it can be no considering that as I or mine or I am anymore. You know, it's interesting. You should look up the disappearing lake in Russia to understand what he's writing about right here, what he's talking about, where whole entire huge lakes that are almost seem like oceans to people and actually are so big they have tides and everything are just disappearing. So when we think that can happen, can we think ourselves as permanent and we're not ever going to disappear? It's quite funny, huh? Because we cannot think of the water inside ourselves as absolutely me and mine and I am that is simply part of the body. The fire element. What friends is the fire element? The fire element may be either internal or external. What is the internal fire element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery and clung to. And that is that by which one is warmed, ages and is consumed. And that by which what is eaten, drunk and consumed and tasted gets completely digested. And whatever else internally belonging to oneself is fire or fiery and clung to. This is called the internal fire element. Both the internal fire element and the external fire element, they are simply fire element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine. This I am not, this is not myself. And when one sees this as it is naturally, as it actually is, with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted in the fire element. And it makes the mind dispassionate towards the fire element itself. Think of fire element when we think of fever, when we have fever, we are sick, this is heat. And this is not me, it is not mine, it is not myself. This is just fire element. Now there comes a time when the external fire element is disturbed and it burns up villages, towns, cities, districts, great forests and countries. And it goes out due to the lack of fuel only when it comes to green grass or to a road or to a rock or to water or to a fair open space. And there comes a time when they seek to make a fire, even with a cock's feather or a hide pairing, a piece of a piece of dried skin of the animal. And when even this external fire element, great as it is, is seen to be impermanent and subject to destruction, disappearance, and change, what of this body? which is clung to by craving and lasts but a while. There can be no considering that as I or mine or I am. So then if others abuse and revile and scold and harass a monk who has seen these elements as they actually are, he would understand everything. Again, we go back to eight. He would understand that even if others abuse and revile and scold and harass that bhikkhu, the painful feeling born of any one of the sense doors, he will see that contact is impermanent. That feeling is impermanent. That perception is impermanent. That the formations are impermanent. That the consciousness is impermanent. And this mind having made an element, 
its objective support the enters into the new objective support observing it and acquires confidence steadiness and resolution and if others attack this monk in those such ways that are unwished for and undesired and disagreeable by contact with such things as fists and clods and sticks or knives, he understands that this body is of such a nature that contact with fists and clods and sticks and knives can assail it. But this has not, has, has been said by the blessed one in his advice on the simile of the saw, that bhikkhus, even if bandits were to sever you savagely limb by limb with a two-handed saw, he who give rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be carrying out my teaching. Now you can turn back if you've been to retreats and you can see uh, Mishima Nikai number 21, section 20, and you'll see where this is repeated in the instructions of how shall we train. So tirelessly energy shall be aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness established my body shall be tranquil and untroubled my mind will be concentrated, it will remain unified and now he now let contact with fists and clods and sticks and knives assail this body for this teaching of the Buddha is being practiced by me. And I understand, I understand what is happening. This is where the person is coming from. Now we look at the air element in 21. What friends is this air element? The air element may be either internal or external. And what is the internal air element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is air, airy, and clung to. And that is upgoing winds, downgoing winds, winds in the belly and winds in the bowels, winds that course through the limbs, in breath and out breath, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is air or airy and clung to. This is called the internal air element. And both the internal air element and external air element are simply air element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not me, this is this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the air element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the air element. And that's how that one works. Now there comes a time when the external air element is disturbed. If you're in Oklahoma, you get to experience this. It sweeps away the villages, towns, cities, districts, and countries. And there comes a time in the last month of the hot season when they seek wind by means of a fan or bellows and even the strands of straw in the drip fringe of the hatches, the thatch in the roof. They do not stir, they do not move. And when even this external air element great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance and change. What of this body, which is clung to by craving and lasts for a while. There can be no considering that as I or mine, or I am that. So then if others abuse and revile, uh, scold and harass the bhikkhu, the same thing is true. And at this point, friends, much has been done by that bhikkhu. He understands this as far as all parts, all of the elements and all parts of the body. He understands it fully. I'm at 26. Friends, just as when a space is enclosed by timber and creepers, grass and clay. It comes to be termed just a house. 
so too when a space is enclosed by bones and sinews, flesh and skin, it comes to be termed just material form. If, friends, internally the eye is intact, but no external forms come into its range and there is no corresponding consciousness engagement, well, then there is no manifestation of the corresponding section of consciousness, meaning contact doesn't happen. If internally the eye is intact and external forms do come into its range, but there is no corresponding consciousness engagement, well, then there is no manifestation of the corresponding section of consciousness. So the eye without consciousness cannot totally see. But when internally the eye is intact and the external forms come into its range and there is a corresponding consciousness for that sense door, engagement occurs, meaning contact. And then there is the manifestation of the corresponding section of consciousness and awareness through cognition. Now, the material form is what has thus come to be, and it, it is uh, included in the material form. The aggregate is affected by clinging. So the clinging is what really makes the suffering come about. The five aggregates do not stand alone and cause suffering. The feeling is what has thus come to be is included in the feeling aggregate by clinging. The perception in what has thus come to be is included in the perception aggregate affected by clinging. The formations in what has thus come to be are included in the formations aggregate affected by clinging. The consciousness in what has thus come to be is included in the consciousness aggregate affected by clinging. He understands thus, this indeed is how there comes to be the inclusion, the gathering and amassing of things into these five aggregates affected by clinging. Now, this has been said by the Blessed One. One who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma. One who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. So in this paragraph above here, this is how you are seeing the parts of the dependent origination being played out in this sutta very, very clearly. And these five aggregates affected by clinging are dependently arisen. There is the I, and forms are dependent on the I, and I consciousness is dependent on the I and forms. And the I and forms and I consciousness make contact, which were, is dependent on them. And with the contact as condition, the feeling can then arise. The desire, indulgence, inclination, holding based on these five aggregates affected by clinging is the origin of suffering. And so here we have the statement without clinging, there's not the suffering. There must be this act of clinging. And thus we prove the monk that walks down the path and can smell the rose and enjoy the rose or smell the orchid and, and go back and say to another monk later, you know, that orchid, it just bloomed on the trail. It's beautiful, but he's not clinging to it. He's not holding on to it. He's simply experiencing it and then walking, continuing to walk. The removal of desire and lust, the abandonment of desire and lust for these five aggregates affected by clinging is the cessation of suffering. So it's not the removal of the aggregates that stop the suffering. 
it is the removal of the clinging of these uh, these aggregates that removes the suffering. So this is why if there's a misunderstanding of this, and there is in many places, there are books written about the suffering aggregates. The aggregates aren't suffering, you know, or the suffering aggregates. <laughs> they're not they're not suffering if it's just talking about the aggregates. We need to be specific about this. We need to really understand it. At that point, too, friends, much has been done by that bhikkhu. And if, friends, internally the ear is intact, the same thing is true, and the same thing is true for the nose and odors, the same thing is true for the tongue and flavors, the same thing is true for the body and, um, and tangibles, and the same thing is true for your mind and for mind objects. Thus, you do not have to kill the thoughts. Thoughts arise. Minds and mind objects will arise. You know, sounds will happen. Odors float around. Flavors come in our mouth. We experience that. Nothing wrong with that. It's clinging. It's holding on to them that causes the suffering, moving them out of their position, moving them into a position where there is clinging that affects this whole situation. So, and then in if friends internally, the nose is intact, but, but uh, no external smells come into range, there is no, no problem with suffering. So this is telling you, it was not something that Buddha said to go and leave the universe, leave the cultural, social engagement, totally and completely go off in the universe, shut yourself in a cave, try desperately not to see, hear, smell, taste, or touch anything. This was not about causing torture to the body to discover or break through anything by torture of the body trying to make our natural operation of our anatomical structure, which operates just fine and try to make it stop. That's not what this is about. It's telling you right here. So the aggregates affected by clinging are where your suffering is. Um, if friends, internally, the tongue is intact, no flavors coming into range, same thing if friends, the internally the body is intact uh, with no external tangibles coming into this range. That is correct also. And in 37, let's do that one again. And the last one, if friends internally, the mind is intact, a healthy mind brain, okay, but no external objects come into its range. There is no corresponding consciousness engagement. And there is no manifestation of corresponding section of consciousness. And if internally the mind is intact and external mind objects come into range, but there is no corresponding uh, consciousness engagement, then there is no um, manifestation of the corresponding section of consciousness. But when internally the mind is intact and external mind objects come into its range, there is the corresponding consciousness engagement. Then there is the manifestation of the corresponding section of consciousness. The material um, form is what has thus come to be uh, in, is included in the material form aggregate affected by clinging. The feeling is what has come to be, is included in the feeling aggregate affected by clinging. The perception in what has come to be, thus comes to be, is included in the perception aggregate affected by clinging. The formations is what has thus come to be, are included in the formations aggregate affected by clinging. The consciousness in what has thus come to be is included in the consciousness aggregate affected by clinging. He understands this indeed is how there comes to be the inclusion, the gathering, the amassing of things 
in these five aggregates affected by clinging. Now, this has been said by the Blessed One. One who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma. One who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. And these five aggregates affected by clinging are dependently arisen. The desire, indulgence, inclination, and holding based on these five aggregates affected by clinging is the origin of suffering. There it is again. The removal of desire, personal desire, lust, and the abandonment of desire then and lust for these five aggregates affected by clinging is the cessation of suffering. At that point, friends, much has been done by that bhikkhu, by that student, by that person who is trying to learn these pieces. This is what the Venerable Sariputta said, and the bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Venerable Sariputta's words. Now, in this sutta, there were six examples of saying, one who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma. One who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. And this is important for us to understand because let's look at it for a minute. Let's go pull up a chart and try to look at this for just a minute on one of the, um, the seven. Let's see if I can do it for you. Um, we have to go here first. Whoops, not there. No, no, I don't have to go there. I just have to go here and find it for you, and I'll be right with you. Mm -hmm. hmm. What's that? Okay. Um, here we go. We will go to find the seven chart. Okay, this is a good enough one for us to look at. Now let's go back to you. And share screen. Go here. So here we are with a seven link chart, which we use for daily training. And we learn the 12 links very carefully. That's true. But we also take these seven, which are in this lifetime, the most valuable for us to understand and exercise. So when we are doing this, and you know what? I don't think I have a pointer hooked up. Not sure about how to do this. Let's see if I can do it. You know what? I'm not sure I can do it. I don't think I can. Okay. It's life. I guess I can. If you look on the left, you will see on the chart contact. So contact happens with each of the sense doors. Now, the green ones on our charts are always part of the anatomical structure, meaning the physiological system of the body, meaning I do not make contact happen. In other words, I do not control what my eye sees, my ear hears, my nose smells, my tongue tastes, or my body feels a tangible touching sensation, or my mind uh, has a mind object arise, I don't always make these, I don't make these come up. They operate with cooperation with the sense doors. So these are the sense doors and with contact as condition, feeling arises. And with feeling as condition, there is a jump into, if it was a painful feeling, there's a jump into, I don't like it. And the, I don't like it mind is the craving. And there is a tension. We are trying to get you to see this tension as you practice your uh, release from anything which is disturbing you. When you let go and when you relax 
between the relaxed step and smile step, it happens very quickly. There is a tiny, 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 tiny spot, which has no craving at all in it. There's a blank spot. And that's a place of no craving. And when you're in the clinging, you are holding on to the craving, okay? And you are making the craving more forceful. So I don't like it jumps into clinging and it says, clinging is the story that runs in your mind about why you like or dislike what came up, you know? And it, it's, it, this includes all of the thoughts, opinions, ideas, concepts, and even imagination about what pops up, <laughs> pops up. I think this is funny that this got stuck here. We can finally change that, I think. There you go, pops up. <laughs> now, the clinging will move into a habitual tendency quickly if you take a hold of it and start with a runaway mind thinking about what you don't like, it will roll over into a habitual reaction. It's a habitual tendency that human beings have. And this is where Bawa is the home. That's where the habitual emotional reactions live in each person. And those reactions are stored up there from the past. And this is about living life. This is why you have these sudden assumptions and reactions very, very quickly. This is the habitual tendency library. And then you move again from there. It jumps very fast when the card is pulled out. I'm going to yell back at this person or something when they yelled at you. Um, you have the birth of the action, which is mental, verbal, and physical action. It's a mental, I'm going to yell back. It's a verbal, probably saying something as you do it, stepping forward physically, you're doing it, the whole thing, the physical act. That's your reaction, you see? And then comes the suffering through that. Without this clinging, this clinging piece, if you were to not like something, you could block the clinging and not cling. Now, what they say is that you cannot give up the clinging, the craving link until you're totally an arahat, until it's permanently you let go of that. But you have building, you are continually building a base of equanimity in your practice of twin. And this is what is so important to understand as you practice twin each time you are building a stronger and stronger uh, base of equanimity. Equanimity is what keeps that monk who was mentioned in this untouchable. He, he's not going to react. He'll move aside to have something miss hitting him or something, but he's not gonna, he's not gonna fight back, you see. He'll move out of the way or move literally out of the way, out of the space where he's in, where people are doing this, he can do that. But he's not gonna come back on, on the people uh, to, to fight back at the level they're fighting at him. That's not gonna happen because of the equanimity that's built up inside you. Is this the removal of fight or flight? No, it's not. Person still has reactions to block, to stop, to move aside, to move aside again this sort of thing. Sure. Um, when I was practicing uh, karate in my 20s, okay, we're talking 50 years ago here. Okay, that gets interesting. Okay, but we're talking, we were studying wadokai karate. And wadokai means strike once to get the person down and run. Do not confront. Do not attack, do not uh, fight, it was not like that. It was sort of like strike once and run like crazy, especially for me as a female, they didn't want me to do that. But I was fighting full grown men at that time, you know, and many of them were big guys from the Air Force coming to the dojo. <laughs> and I was the first woman in that dojo, it was quite amusing. And then later they let another Chinese girl come in there, Lucy, and I think her name was Lucy. And she wanted to be, uh, basically, she wanted to be a person that was uh, able to uh, keep people out of, the, out of the officer's club. That's what she was doing. She wanted to be 
the person at the door who was going to keep the people from uh, bad guys from going in. And she was very effective. She was a very fast learner. But the years I spent there working on that, uh, I now can understand with this being all explained why it isn't necessary to be aggressive toward the other person. You know, the thing is worldwide, we have to look at something. If we can ever improve the world at all, we have to get ourselves into a, a position of basically not coming after the person the way they came after you. It isn't about that. That never stops. It's been there from the beginning of time. Yeah. So this is where you see you begin to see um, a little bit of a difference in this chart because you see if you look at it at the bottom you see emotion 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 at the bottom emotions start like in the middle of craving just after you say I don't like something then the emotion pops up emotions have names emotions are not feelings feelings are you know, uh, pleasant, painful, or neutral. And it gets really clear as you start to watch people. There is a pause, split second pause sometimes, but that pause is there before the initial uh, feeling and the dislike for it before there's any action. There's a, there's a split second before you go into, I don't like it. And then that emotion pops out. So emotions, when I say emotions have names, Anger, fear, depression, frustration, panic attacks, anxiety, grief, all of these things are emotional states. You can come up with more, sure, you can. But the baseline feelings in neurocognitive science are they're pretty agreeable with this, that there is this thing that happens before that emotion hits that's different, and that's feeling. Okay. So I wanted to show you this on the chart and um and pop out now and um, and anybody got anything to say about this? <laughs> this little, um, this one sutta. Hmm? Questions? Yeah. Hi, you. Uh, Liz, you know, uh, Sarah has a question. She's just here. Yeah. Hi, Hi. Hi. Okay. So I've got I've got this question written down. Um, it's it's just about one um. Yeah, one excerpt from the passage we've been reading. It's the mm -hmm. one that is at um. But a doesn't it? At the end of number eight. And it, it reads here on page 279, and his mind, having made an element its subjective support, enters into right. that new objective support and acquires confidence, et cetera, et cetera. And, and my question is, I don't understand the reference to the element making it an objective support or entering into the objective support, because I can't oh, see... Big. What mm -hmm. more adds to the previous sentence about impermanence of the candidates other than the mind gets steady? And I was looking at the footnotes as well, and it seems that the Pali can be interpreted differently about the elements as referring to the candidates and also the four elements. So I wondered if you could- Well, the way we talk that. about the water element that's being used as an example there, you take the water as your object, okay, for a split second, and it's like we talked to you about, you know, there's water coming down a stream. This comes from 62 when the Buddha was talking to Rahul and he was explaining the elements. Remember, I told you he then described for, uh, for Rahula um, how to practice using the elements. And this is actually referring to that when it mentions this thing about objective support. The objective support enters into that new objective support. That point where somebody's throwing going to throw stuff at you and stuff like that. If it was, if you were using water as your element, to, you keep the water in your mind. And when a water comes down on a waterfall and it comes to a rock, what does it do? It goes around the rock. It doesn't push the rock aside or fight with it or anything. It 
it becomes your objective support. You see, for you to remember about water and how it goes down a hill. And when it comes to a rock, it splits, you know, it splits like this and it goes around the rock. It doesn't just try to fight with the rock that it's there. And this, that's what this is actually talking about is an objective support. You have an object in your meditation, but when you're working, um, you know, with your meditation, if you run into a hindrance and you don't know what to do, you can practice by using the elements. Mm. And, and you refer to what he told you about the elements in 62. And he describes how, do you remember it or not? Because I can read I you the, be like, the yeah. if you if you if you go to 62, you will go to page yeah. um wait a minute, I'll tell you. You would go to the part in the beginning where um he's <laughs> there's a there's a crow here who has something to say about everything. He's out my window. <laughs> okay, you would go to where it says um mm-hmm. Section nine, page 528, section nine. And it would say a water element. Oh, well, that tells you what the water element is. And they told, no, did you notice in this suit they told you the same thing? They told you what each element was according to the way the Buddha teaches the elements, which he teaches us that the whole world exists from your head to your feet. And so the elements inside the world, they exist as these, the, the elements for him are taught all six elements are taught as part of the body. So the other two elements are, um, I think it's uh, space is one and consciousness is the other one. Mm -hmm. You have four traditional elements and then you have space and you have consciousness. Some suttas have six of them and some of them have four and some even have five of them, okay? But this one, when it's, this is, this was section nine tells you what the element is. And then at the bottom at 13, section 13, he starts to tell him how to practice his meditation. Flip the page to 530 and you'll see that when it's water, he says, Rahula develop meditation that is like water. For when you develop meditation that is like water agreeable arisen agreeable and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and remain it's just as water uh, as as people wash clean things and dirty things excrement urine spittle pus and blood in the water and the water is not repelled or humiliated or disgusted. It doesn't react because of that. So too, you develop meditation that is like water. Uh, for when you develop meditation that is like water, agreeable uh, and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and remain. So he, what he's saying here is like, remember we're talking about when in this uh, elephant footprint, we're going to refer to the monk and things are being thrown at him. Yeah, the things are being thrown at him. So when the things are being thrown at him in this in this uh, story, he's it's all tied together. You need this other objective support. If if the monk look, if you were if you were on a street in there, say you and I were going to the Coliseum for a game or something, and there was a big sort of riot thing that happened outside in the parking lot, and we had to go, and they were throwing stuff at us. You know, if we started thinking just about that, we, we'd fall down and try to go like this, and we wouldn't even run away. We'd be scared to death. But if we put it in another framework, this is just stuff, and it's not about me or mine or myself that this is all happening, just, just stuff. So oh, we take another thing like water, and we go around this whole thing, and we just leave, and we go around it, and we don't fight back. This is what he's trying to talk about here. It's not fighting back. So if you go back and you look at the value of the different um, the different uh, elements that were explained in 62, and I know it's way, you know, it's a different place. The book doesn't have an order, like, you know, it's all hooked together. It's in different place. And I know it's kind of funny, but it's because we know this from this, this uh, that you really working with the suttas a lot, you find there's all these different reference points for this stuff finding showing up in different suttas. Just like 148, there's the thing I always tell you about the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape. I can find that in three or four different suttas. You see, 
it's sprinkled through. Well, this is the same sort of thing. And this is what he's talking about adopting. It's saying um, that he takes, uh, having made an element, uh, an element its objective support, so he decided to take water as an objective support. He enters into it, into that. And when it says that, it means into that new objective support for him when he's going through anything and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. That's how that is. You get it? So you have to play with situation. Integrity of the elements and, and you, but I, I suppose I wasn't clear about how that would um, tie into when we have our object of meditation in twin and we when when, our, what? when when when, what? when we have our object of meditation in, in when we're practicing twin and then we would six r and then come back so this is like well um you know obasa another, you know another way yeah you know about obasa the chinese nun networks with the damasuka sometimes if you i don't know if you've I ever know, been exposed to her but i i she haven't always yet. takes water for her meditation so when oh. she's working in her meditation, if any, if any hindrance arises, she treats it like water. She uses water for, for how to handle it. You know, I like water too. A lot of us like water because it just, it just shows you how it doesn't get upset at all. And it just goes around with what's ever in its path and it never leaves its object of meditation. You just go around the fact that that hindrance came up and ignore it. The hindrance has so you nothing like for you. It's like another, a another layer then when you're six r you, You've come up with some things disturb the mind and you, you're, you're, you're six Some people, well, some people can't just six r <laughs> Some people can't just let go, you know? And so they need okay. something else to okay. process it through to let it go. And that's what the water's doing or the fire or the air. Or the earth. Oh, it doesn't matter which one you use. You remember how the earth yeah. would behave. You're remembering how the earth would behave, or the water would behave, or the fire would behave. Or I, I use that a lot in my in my movement practice. So I, I'm sorry. I'm right. I I would use that. I think I intuitively use that a lot in my movement practice. I listen. I listen to the elements, and that brings a, a, a harmony through the body. And it's it's it, it's it feels very really simple and natural to me, but I I haven't used it so clearly like that in the meditation because I stayed with the six hour process. But the I thing I try are, to impress upon people is to just remember what's feeding your hindrance. But for some reason, people don't want to remember that one. <laughs> you know, our attention is feeding the hindrance. And if it, it, it couldn't be my fault for his sake, there must be some <laughs> other reason. <laughs> you know that I'm trying to was trying to come up with a simile about that the other day. It's like because I had somebody just no matter how much I explained it to them, were absolutely adamant they weren't going to use that that way. You know, and, and um, that they were just going to let. And how many? Suttas have we taught on that? How how many times have we tried to explain that you are feeding the hindrance? I tried to force them almost to, I didn't force them, but I wrote it out and printed it in big print and I sent it to them. I said, put this in your pocket, read it every day. No obstacle can become an obstruction unless I engage in it. That's from 22. How much clearer can you get than that? It's like, but it's interesting. It's not their fault. It's not my fault. What it is, is it's indelibly imprinted on them from their life to the point where they are now that we must fight and defend ourselves from anything that disturbs us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If that's what we're, that's what, and so what are we actually pressing against? We're pressing against Atta, <laughs> you know, this is me, this is mine, this is myself, and nobody can tell me otherwise. Yeah, well, I'm not telling you to give up you. I'm saying, look at you in another way, as a bag of rice. <laughs> as a bag of rice, not really um, sort of boosting your <laughs> but ego, but you're a bag of rice. I'm a bag of hill rice, red rice, beans, white beans, brown beans, blue beans, and green beans. And that's what comes out of this sack, you know, this sack. That's all that's there. 
See, no, this week I'll tell you something. I may as well tell you. Because I was, <laughs> they were talking about what do, what do monks do uh, when they're faced with difficult situations? What do they do when they're faced? And so they were going back and talking about how, always do this. These The older monks, they always do this. They go back and tell the stories again and again of the Buddha and his monks and what they do. But the question was, what do you do as a monk or a monastic today if your face is something? So I gave him the story of Puna just to be nice, you know, because Puna was the one that went and had the clods and sticks and fists and knives and everything. He was assailed by those things and, and they didn't want him to go teach there. And the Buddha came and asked him the question. He said, yep, that's where I'm going. And he asked him the question again. And he said, yeah, I'm going and I'm going to forgive him and then teach him. Forgive Give him and then teach him and forgive him and then teach him you know and i and just use loving kindness and the buddha finally said okay you ready go ahead <laughs> he let him go and i think the monks wanted him to stop him you know but i gave him that story and then there were a couple you know there was some other things and then i said you know look i had a really interesting week it wasn't particularly that it was a rough and terribly week but it was pretty much confirmed i have cancer yeah, and it's metastasized, and here I am. This is me, and the, the I told them what happened, and it, and they they couldn't understand why I'm sitting here smiling because how can I be upset when I've been teaching for like how many years have I been teaching you that you arise and you're here and you disappear? Why why if it's not ingrained in me by now that Anicca is real? Anicca is real. We're all terminal. We're all leaving. You just don't know when. And, you know, they don't even know for sure exactly what this is yet, but they know what's all over the skeleton. They know there's all these little lesions all over the, the ribs and stuff. And now they got to figure out what's really going on. Oh, okay, fine. But the doctor was shocked when he said, you know, this is serious. And if you're going to write something, go home and start writing it. That's what he said. And I said, well, let me ask you something. And he said, what, are you going to have chemo? Are you going to do radiation? And he said, well, this could be a combination to you. I said, well, that's fine, because I've already lost my hair. <laughs> and then he cracked up, you know, because everybody, women are usually really upset if they lose their hair. You know, look at me. Why am I going to get upset about this? What's the big deal here? And this is all changed now. The treatments, I'm kind of interesting. I was a cancer registrar for a big hospital when all the research began in Massachusetts and I knew all the treatment and how rough it was. It's not so much anymore with a lot of these things. It is not that serious. The, the treatments have been reduced to taking a tablet and staying home instead of being locked in a ward in a hospital and held away from the world. It's not the same thing anymore. So everything is, we're talking, I did this uh, 52 years ago, <laughs> okay? And I'm thinking, wow, you know? So, so uh, this is serious when you're coming into life. And then was interesting because all the people, they just went, mm, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, it's all right. You can all smile about it because I've been here and I'm still teaching and I'll teach till I die. But, but the whole point is I can't seem to get upset about this. And when I said it to a friend of mine, he said, well, how, why do you expect to get, how many times have you given classes on this? Death and dying, dying with grace and dignity with a clear mind, right? How many times have you taught people how this works and what to do? So if you don't get it yet, I mean, this is it, okay? So this is where we are. So there's no reason to get all upset about it. There's nothing we can change about what is the truth. You remember that part in uh, Bunty made sure it was in the instructions. Anytime you try to do this and you try to change the truth, you want the truth to be what you want it to be. You want to make it something else, blah, blah, blah. You're, that causes a lot of suffering. Well. My gosh, I told this to the whole world. Oh my, afterwards I, I said to them here, I said, you know, I wasn't gonna tell anybody. <laughs> and so now I told everybody, so, okay, fine. So here we are. I don't feel any different, except there's this kind of little place of not keeping a secret, which was disturbing, you know, that's just not there anymore. 
so I was cheering people up at the hospital and stuff like that. I, I think this is wonderful. I remember, this is funny. I remember when I first started working with Bonte, there was some things hanging over me. At one point, I, I said to him, it's sarcastically, because I knew it wouldn't happen, but I said, what if somebody prosecuted me for something involving something and I ended up in prison? He said, well, that's a good place to teach. It's a good place to teach. Your students aren't going anywhere. <laughs> We're driving along and the guy, students aren't going anywhere. They've got their rooms. They got their food. They got work time. They're going to exercise. They are. They're told to, you know, and, and your, your students aren't going to disappear. That's a pretty good setup, you know. So look at this. If I end up in a hospital, if that's what they do to me, well, I'm certainly going to drive the nurses crazy. I won't put up with them frowning and feeling sorry for anybody. After all, everybody's going to end up coming this way, whether you do it at home or you go in the hospital. So what's the difference? I've been spending years going in hospitals, cheering people up cheering nurses up and doctors and other things. So come on, you know, I, I, so that's just the way this approach to this whole thing is, you know, and I think some of the people I've met so far are kind of comical, you know, I have to tell you something really, really serious. You're terminal. Okay, fine. What's next? <laughs> yes. And this is what you have to stop and turn around and look at. Can you do that with yourself? Can you do that? You see, can you do that? And if you, I, I think part of it is having given up all the household stuff, having sold everything, having given it away, having sent everything to the kids, having given it to the church, having given all this stuff away all over the place. When I went into this, that was fun. <laughs> One time I went to a storage facility to empty it in Maryland. And when I got there, there was the little girl, or the daughter of the owner of the storage facility was in tears because she was pregnant and her husband lost his job and they didn't have any place to live. And she was giving them uh, one of these facilities that actually had a window in it to turn it into a place for them to live, but they had nothing. I said, oh, well, come with me. <laughs> they went in my storage facility and what she walked out uh, with uh, was a couch and a chair and a crib and all the stuff she needed for her babies. And the kids didn't want the baby stuff handed down because they're in different states, you know, and they didn't want to pay to ship it. I said, called him up the next day. I said, forget it. Just forget it. Here's somebody who needed everything. So they have everything, you know, and it's like the universe was putting this in front. You need to clean this, this facility out. And so when you go to clean it out, there it went <laughs> down the street and that was it. And another time in one of the other facilities, a guy was starting a business and I didn't have any need for the, we had, I had, I had put away a whole business unit uh, for what I did in human resources before. And he ended up with his desk and his chair and all of this stuff for the office. And that was fun. I would much rather be doing that for people than trying to sell it on the yard sale or something like that. It was much more fun to do it this way. So we, we had a, a lot of fun. You know, I had a lot of fun back then giving away everything. You know, I had been uh, singing and um, for this last stretch of singing that I did with concerts, I had wigs, nice ones, beautiful wigs. You know, it was kind of like Cher, Sonny and Cher, you know, <laughs> you know? And, and I had six of these wigs. And I said, you know, nobody wants the wigs. When this woman saw the wig, she went, oh my gosh, you have wigs. I said, do you want wigs? She said, no, but all these people, these are cancer patients. They don't have any money for wigs. <gasps> I said, that's so cool. Give them all a wig. <laughs> so we gave six wigs to people. You see, it's really can be fun. You know, you have to decide to make everything fun. It's, and I guess I'm like a little child, but I just don't see any reason to get upset about this because, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> you just have to do what you got to do and see what comes next. And if you're staying here, it's not so hard because if you're stuck here or you're stuck over here, it's, it, this can be hard. This can be hard, but you're not stuck if you're just here. You just have to deal with people who are, oh, I'm so sorry that you're sick. I'm so sorry you're going to die. Oh, my God. I said, Don't worry about it. Let's go play. <laughs> Let's go to the ocean. Let's go for a walk. Let's go do something. Let's go save a puppy, save a kitten, do something. Yeah. So 
it's a strange thing. I've always thought it was a strange thing. Everybody gets excited when the baby's born, but when people die, um, then there's not so much excitement. <laughs> I know it sounds weird, but um, some people actually forget to celebrate the person's life. And the other thing is, then you go to the celebration of the person's life. You should encourage people, don't celebrate the person's life after they're gone. For heaven's sakes, if they're conscious and they're in the hospital, instead of going in there and saying, oh, I'm so sorry, you're feeling so bad. I'm so sorry, it hurts, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm just feeling terrible because you're, you're hurting. Well, you're hurting too, but why don't you come in with a, a, a scrapbook with all the pictures the family has and sit there with them while they're awake and conscious and start talking to them about the things you remember and the things you did and then have the scrapbook. And when we did that with people, it really, really helped. It really, really helped. Because you know what? Those people were busy then. The, the, worst, the worst thing for you when I'm going to die is you didn't know what to do. <laughs> you don't know what to do. Okay, so go build me a, a pagoda or something. <laughs> you know, build a pagoda for the dogs and cats in the neighborhood, that would be good <laughs> with a whole bunch of entrances to get out of the rain. You know, I, I'm not, I'm just clowning now, okay? But the point is, why do we have to get so upset about it? And then I thought about it. The reason is, it isn't because of the person that's dying. It, the reason they're upset, people think it's because they're dying. Actually, they're super duper concerned about what's going to be like for you when they die. That is the thing, see? So it's important that we, we um, try to handle that part of it. I think that's very important. And uh, you know that's kind of hard for me because the kids are all back in the United States and I haven't said a word. So I, I, they never watch me. So I'm not worried about that. <laughs> You know, but I'm gonna have to say something now, you know, because of what I did this past week. So that's it, <laughs> you know, and we just go on and we do the best we can. And this is working out over here in Poland. It's working out very well because it is cold. It's cool to sleep. And because when I got off the plane, it was 30 degrees Celsius cooler than India. And within about two weeks, it's been about two weeks, my blood pressure went completely down and that is completely corrected. I don't need any medication because it's cool and because it's level when I'm walking and I can take walks every day and I couldn't before. And it, there's no dirt here, no dirt. There is no dirty air, there is no dirty water, there is no dirty food and there's nothing that is boiled so long that there's no vitamins in it at all. So the diet's completely corrected. You're walking, you're drinking water, you can live on water and you're not that hungry because you're eating food that is actually got vitamins and things in it to strong. So you're not eating poor food at all. So this is a big change. You know, it's a huge change. I want to go back. I will go back and teach, but I'm gonna have an extra suitcase with food in it. <laughs> No, that's probably true. Although, you know, where I know where I'm going, so it's pretty okay. But um, the shock is that I haven't had rice in three in two weeks now. I haven't had rice. But I had potatoes. Yeah. So I, I have certain things that I was never able to really cook for here. And they're very good to me. And it's like, uh, it's like the grandmother and the three sons. Yes. And they're all very clean cut, you know, and have, they're very good people taking care of me. And my quarters are private from their quarters and it's all fine. You know, it's a very nice setup. So we're all very happy <laughs> and then it's working really well. And the doctors are nice here. We just have to get the full picture and it takes a long time. So we're still stuck in diagnostics and not in treatment. So we will get to that point, but we're trying very hard to get to the, get through uh, the treatment. So that's what's going on. <laughs> so, you know, when you think you have a bad day, just call me. I mean, you know, <laughs> this is what you do. You just call me, I'll straighten you out, you know, because so, remember so what goes up, it comes down, you know, that's it. Mm -hmm. So, so Sakima, are you are you starting the retreat tomorrow? 
What? No. The retreat for June has been canceled because we didn't consider, we, we considered the guys we were asking and they all said yes. And they went to their clients and they all said no. <laughs> so oh. their, the, the schedules for the life coaching for the, for the, uh, the clients was not adjustable to this time, but it worked out well because we have to go through a full line of diagnostics. And so this is perfect. So we have June and July to straighten this out. In August, we rescheduled the retreat for August. Now this is way in advance and everybody's agreed to come back in August. So I was gonna get in touch with you and tell you that if you wanted to do that, you probably could in August for yep. a short yep. period of time for that. Yeah, if, you, yeah. if you'd like to send me the dates um, uh, when you've got them um, and, and any other details, uh, you know, location and stuff. Um, yep, yeah, let, let's see if that- I will let that. you know, okay? But that's yeah. why I, did, I was telling you, I would probably get with you uh, um, later, <laughs> okay? So- <laughs> I am, <laughs> you know, and that's about it. So let's say our prayer, okay, everyone. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. The one, the one bell got jealous of the other bell, so we had to get the other bell out. <laughs> Thank you, sister. So you all Thank have you. a good week. Okay. Be happy. Keep smiling. Okay. I'll see you next week. Yeah.